As far as the Chinese Revolution is concerned, um, when it took place, everybody from imperialists to their flunkies everywhere else, that China would never rise for a hundred years. Nothing will happen to it. But in a very short period of time, the Chinese had tremendous achievements to their credit. The first and foremost was to eliminate imperialism and its influence in China. Ever since the Opium War, in which China was defeated in 1840, Chinese people had suffered under the heel of not only principal imperialist powers, but also smaller imperialist powers, the principal being, of course, Britain, France, and the United States. And then um, the, the, there were the, the, the Danes came, and the R Russians came, everybody came to the Chinese eliminated imperialism. Secondly, the Chinese eliminated feudalism. Now, it took a bit longer, but the very, very tyrannical landlords and the gentry were confiscated almost soon after the Chinese Revolution. And it takes, of course, a number of years before collectivization takes place and the distri distribution of land. So the, the character of the Chinese Revolution was that it was anti-imperialist and anti feudal They achieved that aim very, very quickly indeed. Thirdly, China has a long history of banditry and warlordism. People who were accountable to no, no, nobody. And when Chiang Kai-shek's forces were defeated and went to uh, Taiwan, some people called it Formosa, they left behind not only the bandits who had never been dealt with by them, because bandits were their friends basically, but also left tens of thousands of their own agents to disrupt the work of the Chinese Communist Party and, and the project of building, build, building socialism. They had to be eliminated. There's a fairy tale told by Western imperialists and their flunkies that when Chiang Kai-shek retreated to Taiwan, he was greeted with open arms. Actually, the local population resisted. And in the process of resisting, tens of thousands of them were slaughtered by Chiang Kai-shek's army. That was Chiang Kai-shek's normal way of dealing with dealing with people. If they are in disagreement, they had, they had to be slaughtered. That, then, uh, within the first three years, the Chinese economy was restored to health and all the production indices showed that production had gone above the peak years of the pre-revolutionary period. And then after that, they laid the foundations for the building of socialism through planned economic construction and through collectivization of agriculture. The first five-year plan, which was formulated by the Chinese planners and economists in close uh, cooperation with Soviet planners and economists between 1935 and 37, achieved remarkable results. And these are considered even under a resolution passed during the time of Deng Xiaoping in 1981 on questions concerning the history of Chinese, Chinese Communist Party, which says these were the best years from the point of view of production and the achievements of the Chinese economy when 161 new large ent ent enterprises were built. During the same time, while they're doing that, they managed to help Korea. They sent hundreds of thousands of their fight fire fighters under the slogan of oppose US aggression, defend Korea, and safeguard the, the mother motherland. And the Chinese made a tremendous contribution to the success of the of the forces of the DPRK in the Great Patriotic War. First time that U.S. imperialism was defeated in a in a ma major conflict. It was a humiliating defeat for the U.S. forces. 
is the first time, according to U.S. generals, that they concluded a war by signing a treaty which did not show them to be the to 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 be to be the the, 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 the winners. And uh, the, the, the and it was a tremendous sacrifice. The Chinese had actually just emerged from a three-decade-long struggle against Chiang Kai-shek's forces, intermingled with fighting against Japanese imperialists who were invading China from 1931 uh, uh, onwards. So these are not small achievements uh, in that period of time. And it, the Chinese showed their internationalism by sending at great risk and great cost their forces to Korea. Of course, there's a very close relationship between the DPRK and China. During China's war of liberation, Kim Il-sung's forces fought on the Chinese side with the Chinese comrades. So they have a long history of supporting each other. So it's not a one-way affair. The Koreans have helped the Chinese people in their difficult hour. And when their difficult hour came, the Chinese people helped them too. And then, of course, during the period throughout 19. 60s, 70s, up to 1978, the Chinese gave tremendous amount of help to the national liberation movements, not only to the Vietnamese during their war against U.S. imperialism, but also the movements in Africa and el elsewhere. So these are the achievements of, of the Chinese Revolution. Thank you very much, Rapal. Before I come to Caleb, I want to do a belated introduction because I missed my moment at the beginning to just say thank you for joining us. And we're on part three of a discussion about the Chinese Revolution and really focusing today on the period from 1949. So we've looked earlier at the roots of the Chinese Revolution movement, the progress of it, the anti-fascist war, the anti-fuel war, the liberation wars. I mean, as Rapal just said there, uh, the communists in China were fighting physically fighting as well as ideologically fighting hard battles constantly for about 30 years. It's a, it's a phenomenal story and it's phenomenal how much ability they still had left at the end of all of that to build a new society and a new life. And 1949, you know, Chairman Mao stood up in Tiananmen Square and said, the Chinese people have stood up. And it was a truly epic moment in the history of humanity in the in the story of socialism in the history of the 20th century you know it's an event second only to the october revolution in its historical significance it brought october right into the heart of asia uh, and ignited again you know a fresh wave of of uh, enthusiasm of confidence for the oppressed peoples for the colonized peoples that they can break out to of the, of the stranglehold of imperialism, that they don't have to submit to the power, the, the seemingly inevitable power of the European colonizers. You know, there was, there was a way to, to break out, become free, become independent, build a prosperous, mm -hmm. uh, dignified life for themselves and their people. So it was a huge moment, not only for China, but for the world and for Asia and the oppressed countries uh, in particular. Um, Hapal, you talked there uh, about quite a lot of important things. Um, so before I come back on any of that, I'll just pass over to, to Caleb. What are the, the kind of highlights you wanted to pick out? Oh, well, a couple of things come to mind. Um, one thing that's worth talking about is, uh, you know, you, you mentioned China's aid to Korea during the Korean War. Um, in the United States, one thing that happened during the Korean War that got a huge amount of attention was there were a number, I mean, we're talking thousands of American soldiers who were captured uh, and in the prisoner of war camps in China uh, confessed uh, to war crimes against the Korean people and uh, became Marxist Leninists. Um, and U.S. media thought, this is crazy. This is, how is this possible? And this, this can't be happening. Uh, and so the whole, the term brainwashing, which is now a big part of American culture comes from that because there was a huge amount of investigation into, uh, they, they thought there was some like magical voodoo that the Chinese communists had. And so there's all kinds of books uh, that have been published and the CIA spent millions of dollars trying to figure out how these good American GIs could possibly be convinced that uh, that the Korean people and, 
and their Chinese allies were correct during the Korean War. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there was the, a film, The Manchurian Candidate, that was made all about this. And it was it was a big part of uh, CIA research in the 1950s because there was just no way that uh, maybe these folks could have realized that uh, that bombing civilians and, and committing horrendous crimes as they committed, uh, you know, was not the right thing to do. Um, uh, and that uh, the Korean War in the United States was was, you know, there, there was McCarthyism. So opposition to it was was quite suppressed, but it was quite unpopular. Uh, the Second World War had just happened. People wanted to return home. They did not want the killing to continue. And there was a demonstration in New York City against the Korean War um, that, that the Communist Party, despite the fact that it was underground and illegal, managed to get you know thousands of people in the streets to protest the Korean War. The, the rally was immediately suppressed by the police. And I, I actually talked with some older comrades who were part of that demonstration against the Korean War during the 19, early 1950s, which was, was quite uh, a feat to pull off. And a lot of people were arrested and a lot of people were injured, but they did effectively have an anti-war rally. Um, and I, I think that's that's a great achievement. Another thing that's worth pointing out is that the Tibetan civil war was also forced on China during this time. And that gets overlooked by historians a lot. But uh, but not only did you have the, the Korean War where China, you know, they intervened and actually Mao's own son died uh, in the Korean War. Uh, but also um, you had, you know, the United States airdropping weapons and bombs and uh, and and uh, and other other entities and fighters, trained fighters. They were training the Dalai Lama's younger brother and, and a group of Tibetan separatists and airdropping them into Tibet and the Tibet Civil War of the early 1950s. Uh, had a huge cost in human life. At least half a million people died. Um, and I, there was an incident a few years back where I think it was in Germany, there was a, a group of Chinese soccer players uh, that were going to be to be playing. Um, and people in the audience uh, at the sporting event, they unfurled the Tibetan flag, the Tibet separatist flag. Uh, and these Chinese soccer players refused to, to play. And there was a lot of uproar and like, oh, how offensive. Why are they violating the, the free speech rights of these players? Well, I've often said to many people, I said, well, imagine that there was a group of, uh, you know, you know, basketball or soccer players in the United States. Then someone in the audience unfurled the Confederate flag uh, in the United States. You can understand why they would refuse to play uh, then. Well, you know, people say, well, how can you make that analogy? Well, the the Tibet Civil War is much more recent than the American Civil War. And it was also uh, a violent, bloody conflict uh, fought by people who wanted to keep slavery intact because that's what the Tibet Civil War was about. They were trying to keep the, uh, the, serf, uh, the serfdom and the feudal system intact. And about half a million people died. That's similar to the U.S. Civil War. So you can understand why a group of American sports and, uh, players, athletes wouldn't play if someone was unfurling the Confederate flag. So you can understand why these Chinese players wouldn't play when they unfurled the Tibet flag. Um, one thing that I think is fascinating is W.E.B. Du Bois, the, one of the most respected African-American scholars, he went to Tibet uh, during the Tibet Civil War, and he wrote glowingly. Um, about how it was amazing to see the Chinese government standing with slaves who were fighting for their freedom and, and getting their freedom. Uh, Anna Louise Strong wrote a very good book called uh, When the Serfs Stood Up in Tibet, and it was Tibetans that were fighting against feudalism. It was the United States that was airdropping these, these, you know, these warrior monks and these advocates of feudalism to try and overturn the revolution. But it was Tibetans uh, who were largely fighting to redistribute the land, uh, to bring equality to women. And that conflict gets kind of written out of history because it, it's not, you know, it's not a convenient narrative uh, for the West. The West was clearly on the wrong side as the Tibetan people were standing up and fighting against feudalism as part of the, the People's Republic of China. Uh, so I just thought that those were, were some interesting insights um, about the early years of the Chinese revolution. Absolutely, Caleb. I mean, I was also going to mention the Anna Louise Strong book. Uh, it's a wonderful account of what what was the fight over and how did the people fight, um, and what did it mean to them that fight? You know, and we always used we, the, the 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 free Tibet narrative. You know, it's like the Xinjiang narrative uh, uh, about Uyghur Muslims and everything. You know, all these things get weaponized because imperialists have always wanted to break up China and use any reactionary force they can find or manipulate or create if there isn't one there. But obviously in Tibet there was one. Weaponize it and and wrap it up in kind of PR uh, fog and use it against China. And they want China, like they want Russia, broken into pieces so they can control the resources and the people more easily. Um, and it's fascinating to read uh, 
Anna Louise Strong talking about, you know, the conditions of the of the serfs in Tibet and what it was they were fighting actually. Because we've had this PR job done on Buddhism and the Dalai Lama as the epitome of kind of peace and dignity and loveliness. And every liberal knows that Buddhism is a lovely religion. But you read Anna Louise Strong about the conditions that Buddhist monks imposed on the serfs uh, in the name of Buddhism, you know, how they flogged people nearly to death and then left them to die because they didn't believe in killing people. I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is Buddhism in name only, right? Form, not content. Uh, and this is exactly how religion was used ac across all feudal regimes, right? That in the name of religion, they find ways to justify, you know, feudal oppression and, and serfdom and all the rest of it. So, you know, it's it's a it's a very uh, important bit of history to understand and and a good lesson in how we're manipulated when it comes to these things. Um, Harpal, I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about the friendship between the Soviet Union and China in the early years of the revolution the rift that came about after the death of Stalin and um, what, that, what, what that did to China, um, both physically in terms of its development, but also to Chairman Mao, who was suddenly left as the kind of soul or the leader, if you like, of world anti-revisionism, which wasn't particularly a position he was, he'd been training for all his life, right? Well, really, the, the whole problem of the split in the communist movement is solely attributable to the triumph of Christian white revisionism in the Soviet Union. After the death of Stalin, once the revisionists had come to power, they quickly moved to consolidate their power. And they did two things. One was, of course, that they could not attack socialism directly. Socialism was far too strongly entrenched in the Soviet Union. Soviet people were wedded to their socialist economy. You could not just say economic planning is rubbish. Marxism Leninism does not work anymore. But they were very much influenced by the glamour of imperialist countries and how the imperialist countries had apparently achieved prosperity. It was, of course, prosperity for the top layers. There were still millions and millions of people, even in the richest country in the world, the United States, who went hungry who were racially discriminated against, who were ba ba badly treated. But Christian whites were very much influenced by, by the glamour. And they convinced themselves all that was because of the market. And the Soviet Union was lagging behind because of the market. Soviet Union was not lagging behind. Soviet Union had made tremendous progress in a very, very short period of time to become the second largest economy in the world before the Second, second, second World War uh, 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 st 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 started. So the, the, so the Christians found the only way they could dismantle socialism, that was to denigrate and bring down one person. Not that he was solely responsible for building socialism, but one person with whose name Soviet achievements were so indelibly linked, and that was Joseph Stalin. So at the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party, Khrushchev apparently delivered a secret speech. It was secret for members of the Communist Party, all ordinary members, but it wasn't secret because the Khrushchevites soon leaked it through Western newspapers and it was published in Western newspapers. So by describing Stalin as a dictator, who violated the norms of this socialist legality, who um, basically was responsible for hundreds of thousands, if not million, million, millions of deaths, and who brought disaster to the Soviet Union. And therefore, once they had denigrated Stalin, they bit by bit got on with, with the marketization of the economy, which over a period of 30 years would bring, bring down the, the, the Soviet Union. Now, when Khrushchev's speech was delivered, there were members of the fraternal party, the Chinese, the Albanians, everyone was, was pre present there. The first reaction of Mao Zedong, as well as Anur Hoja, was to support Comrade Khrushchev, that he had brought socialist legality back to the Soviet Union 
they were now on Lenin's track. It took them quite a couple of years before they realized that they'd, they'd been fooled. And so at certain stage, they started opposing this anti-Stalin campaign. And they also criticized the market reform that, 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 that were coming. And that is what really put them on the, on, on the, on the wrong side. And as this uh, dispute acceler accelerated, it became more and more virulent. Uh, it was not conducted, if you like, in a comradely fashion. It was conducted like it was a struggle between ourselves and, and, and the enemy. And of course, every imperialist power grasped this occasion with great glee. And some even supported China, that China was fighting for real socialism, whereas the Soviet Union had betrayed it. No doubt the Christians were trying to betray so, 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 socialism. So the, the um, thing got really out of hand. And most of the communist parties around the world did not side with China or Al Albania. Most of them sided with, with, with the Soviet Union. And so there would be conferences of various communist parties. And Khrushchev would attack the Communist Party of China at the congresses of fraternal parties, like the Romanian Com Com Communist Party. And of course, the Chinese were obliged to answer these accusations and fought a tit for tat battle. And it escalated over a, over a period of time. And what was it? ideological dispute between two communist parties very soon assumed the struggle between two states, between China and the, and the Soviet Union. And it, there came a time when whatever the Soviet Union did, the Chinese opposed. And the best example of that is the when Warsaw Force, Warsaw Pact forces came to Czechoslovakia to prevent the triumph of Dubček's um, uh, pra Prague claim, And that is when the Chinese declared that Soviet Union was no longer just revisionist. It had become social imperialist. Socialism in world, but imperialist in deeds. Personally, I happen to be on the side of Castro. What would they have liked? Would they have rather liked that the Prague Springs succeeded and Czechoslovakia became a vassal of US imperialism 20 years earlier than it actually took to, to do so? But that, that, is, that, that is another uh, s s story. The Soviets um, were in Afghanistan at the in invitation of the Afghan regime and the Chinese opposed that and regarded it as an example of Soviet social imperialism. So really, that in summary is, is, is what happened. A lot of things Chinese did were correct, but I don't think they did everything correct in, 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 in that struggle. Thanks. And just before I move over to Caleb, Hopal, I wanted you to talk to us a little bit about the impact of um, Khrushchev's Soviet Union withdrawing the material help it had been given. You know, uh, in the early stages of construction of socialism, construction of industry in China, there were Soviet experts were in China helping them, you know, to build up their industry. So that must have been quite a blow, right, on their development. It, it was because the Soviet planners had not only helped the Chinese planners devise the first five-year plan, more than that, the Soviet Union gave material help, gave the Chinese blueprints for the development of these industries, you know, how you develop them and what, what you do. And something like 160 industries, you know, which form the core of the success of the first five year plan were actually accomplished with the help of Soviet help. This was the greatest possible fraternal aid given by one country to another any, any time up to then and probably since then. And when the dispute started between the Soviet Union and China on ideological questions, eventually 
Khrushchev withdrew without any notice. The Soviet experts who were working in China and scrapped the technology agreement with China under which the Soviet Union agreed to provide China with high technology, including reportedly the um, uh, n nuclear te technology. So uh, the Khrushchevites did that, which put China in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a difficult si si situation. And of course, very shortly, it'll get further exacerbated during the Cultural Revolution. Caleb. Sure. Um, I mean, there's a number of things that are worth pointing out about that. Um, one being that it was the strategy of the U.S. imperialists to divide China and the Soviet Union. That was their strategy. Uh, we know going as far back as during the Korean War, the New York Times uh, published uh, documents saying that, uh, you know, well, while, you know, the Chinese people may be honest in their communism, they don't want to be victims of, of Moscow's attempt to build a new empire, et cetera. And that, that there were articles already in the bourgeois press, you know, saying that, that it should be the focus of the American intelligence apparatus to try and divide uh, the Soviet Union from China. Um, and that, uh, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the, the so-called secret speech, um, there was a document published by the Chinese Communist Party on the historical experience of the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, that did embrace to some degree or other the, the quote unquote de-Stalinization uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it, it appears that there was hope on the part of American intelligence and the, the U.S. government that they could make China into kind of a, another Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia had in 1948 broken with the Soviet Union and was the first socialist country to become an enemy of the Soviet Union, right? And it was it was a socialist country. It was led by a Marxist-Leninist party, but you know, opportunism prevailed and they sided with the United States during the Korean War and they were, you know, demonizing Stalin. Trotskyites were embracing them. The Socialist Workers Party of the United States, the Trotskyites were sending delegations to Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia, even though it was a socialist country, was aligning with the imperialists. And I think the U.S. imperialists were hoping that China could move into that camp. Um, and there was that initial document published, uh, you know, and there were relations. Uh, there was some talks between China and Yugoslavia, uh, but ultimately that did not prevail. And in the lead up to the, the Sino-Soviet split, China published some really amazing documents. And we at the Center for Political Innovation are in the process of publishing one of them uh, called Long Live Leninism. Uh, which is a very good document. Uh, but they also published, I think, uh, on the, what is it, a uh, critique of the general line of, of the international communist movement. Um, there's another good document critiquing a leader of the Italian Communist Party. It's called On the Differences Between Comrade Tagliati and Us. And these documents that the Chinese Communist Party was publishing, uh, you know, the first one, the one critiquing Tagliati was aimed at a leader of the Italian Communist Party. And uh, I think there were some others that were that were aimed at Yugoslavia at first. But it was very clear they were critiquing the Soviet Union. And when they published Long Live Leninism and when they published Critique of the General Line of the International Communist Movement, they were they were at that point pretty blatantly criti criticizing the Soviet Union uh, for Khrushchev's foreign policy, uh, that this doctrine of the three peacefuls. Right. Um, you know, a, a peaceful, uh, a peaceful transition between capitalism and socialism, peaceful coexistence between capitalist countries and socialist countries and peaceful competition between socialism and capitalism, meaning that basically Khrushchev said that the idea that there was going to be socialist revolutions anywhere but the socialist world. That couldn't happen because the danger of the atomic bomb was too great. Uh, the idea that um, you know that 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 socialism would start to expand uh, that that was you know no longer possible again because the United States had the atomic bomb. But basically, that because the Soviet Union had a centrally planned economy, they would just produce material goods so well that they would prove the efficiency of socialism. And that would that would prove that socialism was better than capitalism, and that was the only you know means of struggle was was through peaceful competition, meaning that the Soviet Union would prove through their efficiency that their, their system was better, and they would just you know aim it at material you know producing material goods. Well, obviously the Chinese Revolution was not going to submit to that. Many people in the colonized world that were out of necessity taking up arms to fight for their national liberation uh, were not going to give up the you know the, their right to do so. Um, and there were many other many other forces in the world that were simply not going to submit to it. 
What I think is particularly interesting is that, um, you know, in the United, the United States, the Khrushchev revelations, um, I guess they call them the revelations, but they were, you know, they were forgery. I mean, I mean, they were falsehoods. I mean, a lot of what was said was just completely and utterly false. And that's that's very demonstrable. I mean, some of the claims we always point to, you know, the claim made by Khrushchev that somehow Stalin was just so afraid when World War II broke out that he broke down crying and hid or something. That's ridiculous. You know, some of the claims of Khrushchev are so ridiculously absurd that you know they were clearly just an attempt to tell the imperialists that Khrushchev was was willing to negotiate with them that he was not you know he was not a revolutionary like Stalin was that they're they're just laughable but um but it caused a huge crisis in the American Communist Party but it also led to the American Communist Party becoming legal again uh you know in in 1956 you had the Khrushchev revelations and they were published in the New York Times uh and and the you know the, the speech was published and many in the American Communist Party thought it was false. They thought that there's no way the Soviet Union leader could have said this. This must be a, a complete false forgery by the imperialists. So then the Communist Party, which had been functioning almost as an underground illegal organization, they had a public national committee meeting where Eugene Dennis uh, came out and publicly said, yes, the Khrushchev revelations, Khrushchev did say this. Um, and as a result of that, many people quit the party immediately. Uh, they lost something like half of the membership immediately because it was just such a blow because these were people who had stood strong against all of the lies and all the political repression and to have the leader of the Soviet Union just come out and say, yes, the, the imperialists were right about Stalin all along. That was too much. And they lost a significant amount of their membership. Um, and then in 1957, Eugene Dennis, uh, published this document called communists take a new look. And they announced that the Communist Party of the United States was planning, was, was having a convention now that they were they were suddenly functioning as a legal entity. Um, they were going to have a convention and discuss the possibility of dropping Marxism-Leninism and dropping any affiliation with the Soviet Union. Um, and then in 1957, you had uh, the first public convention the Communist Party had had, uh, you know, again, where they, they divided into three factions. And John Gates led the faction that wanted to completely drop Marxism-Leninism, merge with the Socialist Party of America and become a, a mass party of socialism, cut all ties to the Soviet Union. Um, William Z. Foster, he led the faction that uh, that wanted to be critical of the Khrushchev revelations, wanted to maintain support for the black national position and the Black Belt South. And, and then there was the centrist faction led by Eugene Dennis and Gus Hall. And they took the position that they maintained Marxism, Leninism as their ideology, but they supported Khrushchev and the Khrushchev revelations, and they denounced the black national position. And uh, the Eugene Dennis and Gus Hall faction aligned with the John Gates faction to defeat William Z. Foster and his allies. Many of William Z. Foster and his allies were kicked out of the Communist Party. William Z. Foster was forced into an early retirement uh, to chairman emeritus, essentially. Um, and uh, Eugene Dennis, uh, Gus Hall, and the John Gates folks prevailed. But then John Gates, a couple months later, began inserting uh, anti-Soviet propaganda into the Daily Worker newspaper uh, about Hungary and other issues. So the John Gates faction was ultimately forced out. And as a result of the secret speech and, and Khrushchev's actions, the Communist Party of the United States was down to about a third of the membership it, it had been to before. I mean, they kicked out the John Gates folks. They kicked out the Khrushchev, uh, the folks that were critical of the Khrushchev revelations, like William C. Foster and others. I mean, Foster stayed in the party, but a lot of, many of his allies were kicked out. Um, and the party was down to maybe two to 3,000 people from... You know, in, in the late 1930s, they'd been 80,000 people. And e even throughout McCarthyism, they'd been at about 10,000 people. But after the Khrushchev uh, nightmare and the secret speech and the nightmare created in the American party, uh, they were down to uh, to roughly two to 3,000 people. Um, and Gus Hall, who had been in federal prison and, and was, you know, I mean, was kind of someone who reminded people of the 1930s, was a very, very strong, uh, you know, large man, uh, you know, of Finnish heritage, who'd been a leader of labor struggles. He was kind of, he had this nostalgia about him. He reminded people of the 1930s. He became the, the figure who came to dominate the American party and took it in the position of just supporting the Democrats, taking the position that because of McCarthyism and all of that, that you have to support the Democratic Party. Khrushchev actually named uh, an American grouping uh, in, in one of his, his attacks on China. He named, uh, he accused the Chinese of having set up a group called Hammer and Steel. 
uh, in America, in the United States to hurt the American party. And the hammer and steel, they're the precursors of what's called the Revolutionary Organization of Labor or the Rayo Light Group. And they were one of the first groupings in the United States the, of people that had been kicked out of the American party that started uh, talking about anti-revisionism. You had something called the Provisional Organizing Committee that was formed. And there were, uh, there were, there were a number of American groups that ultimately rejected uh, the Khrushchev revelations and started, you know, started organizing outside of the American party. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting development. But the, the secret speech was a, a huge blow to the global communist movement. The French Communist Party had significant losses as a result of it. Um, and it coincided with the Hungarian, you know, the Hungarian uprising, which we know was a CIA, you know, a move against the Soviet Union. And all over the world, especially in, in Western Europe, you had people that were, were, you know, devastated by the secret speech and devastated by the Khrushchev revelations, moving um, then to support the Hungarian so-called so revolutionaries that were against the Soviet Union. Um, and that was the beginning, kind of planting the seeds of what later became Euro-communism, uh, was, was the folks that were breaking with the Soviet Union um, and, the, and the, the confusion that the secret speech, um, you know, Im had on the world. I mean, it, it, the, the impact of the secret speech shouldn't be underestimated. The fact that Grover Fur wrote that book, uh, Khrushchev Lied, and, and dug into the contents of the secret speech is very important because I don't think there's been a, a, ever, a, ever a speech in history that had a bigger impact, and it was a negative impact. I mean, it, it devastated in the global communist movement um, and significantly weakened it. So I guess it's it's worth touching on. Absolutely. And, you know, the ramifications of that are felt, have been felt throughout, you know, her pa's lifetime, our lifetime. You see it still in the movement today. And in particular, you know, for me, the biggest impact of, of Khrushchevism on the world communist movement is the essential scrapping of theoretical study and founding your action in a deep knowledge an understanding of socialist science. People just gave up on it. Khrushchev told them, though, the class struggle's over, and they went, oh, good, <laughs> you know? And it's like they gave up the responsibility to think and study for themselves. And it's why so many parties are still so open to manipulation by plausible sounding, theoretical sounding ideas. If you have a, if you have some knowledge of theory yourself, you're not so easily manipulated by these things. But, you know, Khrushchev initiated this, this sort of wave of anti-theoretical kind of culture in all of the communist parties, which is, which is still a major problem today, that they have leaderships who say Marxism, they say Leninism, like a sort of religion, you know, like before the cross, but they don't study Marxism, Leninism, they don't understand it, they don't implement it in their policies. They're entirely of still of the Khrushchevite view that we just have to kind of make peace with our ruling class and persuade them, like you talked about, persuade them nicely, step by step, that there's a better way, which of course socialist science tells you absolutely there's no chance of doing that. Um, Harpal. No, I mean, I, 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 I completely, completely agree with the, 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 the damage that was done. You see, in, in, in our lifetimes, two things have damaged the international communists most, and then, and they caused tremendous harm. The harm is not caused by our enemies in the imperialist camp, but by people within our movement. One is the betrayal by social democracy during at the, by the time of the start of the First World, World War. And the second one is, is Khrushchev's speech. These are two devastating events in the lives of the international, international communist movement. And the international communist movement has still not recovered from it. In my book, Perestroika, The Complete Collapse of Revisionism, I try to lay out the reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I it was done really by way of a contribution to understanding the whole process and making my little contribution to the development of the communist movement. But has the communist movement taken any no notice of it? No, not to my knowledge, unless I somehow passed it by, because I think marketization of the Soviet economy is what actually laid the basis for the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's one of the reasons that I'm critical of the marketization of large swathes of the Chinese economy. Now, some of my former associates have accused me of being a Trotskyite. Well, each one to his own, they use their own theoretical knowledge to come to these profound conclusions. It's not a question of Trotskyites. 
you have to ask yourself the basic question. Is it or is it not the function of socialism, of communism, of Marxism, Leninism to put an end to the market? And if people are trying to do the opposite, to reinforce and reinvigorate the market, this is not something which is very good for, good, good for socialism. So we have got to be, while supportive of China, we've got to be critical of some of the things that, that take taken place. We can't just sleepwalk into, into whatever can, comes from China. I'm a great supporter of China. And I don't care what somebody says that I'm anti-China because I'm not. I've even gone to the extent of saying, whatever the social system in China, I welcome the rise of China after a century of humiliation. And it's a big counterweight to imperialist hegemony. I do not want China to go the same way as the Soviet Union. If it did, the communist movement would be put back by another three or four, four decades. I do not want, want to see that. And on hindsight, although I was very critical of Chris White witness, I am of the view that the Soviet Union even run by the revisionists was a better place than what came afterwards. You know, the movement could have sorted out the problem of revisionism by ideological struggle, but it could not be sorted out by getting rid of all the struct structures of, 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 of so so socialism. Absolutely. Thanks, Dad. Um, I'm just mindful of the fact we've gone on quite a tangent, although a very interesting and important one. I just wanted to come back to um, the Chinese revolution and the character of that revolution. So, you know, in the beginning, they talked about it being a, a people's revolution. They called, talked about new democracy. They didn't say that they were at the socialist stage in 1949. So why was that? And did that change? And if so, when and why? Hrupal. The, the change could only take place on the basis of change, changing the economic base. When China was liberated, China was a semi-feudal, semi-imperialist country, so they had to get, get rid of that. And it took them a good um, four or five years to get rid of the uh, feudal aspect of the Chinese economy. Only when they had succeeded that and they had you know, accomplished the first five-year plan, and they've accomplished the collectivization of agriculture, which almost happened about the same same time. Could they say now that we are now transitioning to the to the socialist stage? So it's not something that you declare we are socialists and you become socialist. There has got to be an economic basis for that, and that is the reason that they continue to call themselves, um, you know. Uh, called the revolution, pe People's Dem Democratic Revolution, became socialist later on. Of course, the Chinese state is still called the, pe the, the, the People's Republic of China. But names stick and names stay, even if the content has moved away, away from them. As Marx and Engels said in their own day, you know, our theory is to bring communism. And these parties are called social democratic parties. But then what is in the name that will pass as long as the party's policy is, is revolutionary. So that, that's what we have. So when the republic was established, it was a people's democratic republic. Its flag is indicative of that. Its name is indi 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 indicative of that. And it's only after the first five-year plan that they move on to the socialist stage. Thanks. Caleb. Sure. Well, there's an important book that was published in the United States called Fan Shan, and it was written by William Hinton. And William Hinton was an American uh, who was living in areas that were run by the Red Army. And after the Socialist Revolution was victorious, he didn't leave. And so he observed directly uh, the impact of the new democratic revolution in this rural village in China. Um, and his account of what happened, was, it was later published during the 1960s and it became very popular. Many people read about you know, how land was redistributed, how the, uh, the peasantry was empowered, uh, the new democratic revolution and its process in a Chinese village. And it's really worth reading. Um, it's one of the few 
pro Chinese Communist Party books you can still get your hands on in mainstream areas in the United States. Um, uh, William Hinton was a, a respected academic in the United States, and then he wrote this this very important book about what he observed directly in this Chinese village. Um, that's that's definitely worth getting your hands on. Um, now, um, as as far as the, you know, the new democratic revolution. Um, you know, new democracy, there was, as, as Harpel mentioned, there were market forces prevailing. I mean, you know, they didn't start ultimately, you know, having a socialist, full on socialist economy until after, uh, after the, the first five year plan and such. Uh, but there was redistribution of land and there was a huge mobilization of the population. Um, they, they sent, you know, the population out to, to deal with, you know, the problem of drug addiction. Uh, there was a huge campaign to wipe out drug addiction. There was a huge campaign uh, against uh, venereal disease, uh, which was a big problem. Um, there were there were huge campaigns to build infrastructure where they mobilized the population to go out and build like, you know, storm levees so there wouldn't be flooding that would kill people. And that that even though the market was still the prevailing economic mode during the early years of the Chinese Revolution, the party clearly had power. And it had the ability to mobilize the public to have big achievements in terms of public health, in terms of infrastructure that were very important. And they had Soviet aid to help them accomplish it. Um, and I think that, that that's what you can remember about the early years, you know, where they kind of laid the basis for the eventual transition to socialism. Absolutely. I think there's something um, really important there about, you know, the early years of the revolution, like you say, Caleb, it wasn't full socialism straight away or, 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 a, or kind of socialist based the economy straight away. But the fact that the socialists, the communists were in charge meant they had these mass campaigns to immediately change the conditions of the people. So I know one of the campaigns was about literacy. I'm sure they did the same in the Soviet Union at the early years. So not just aimed at education for little children, uh, which of course they also transformed, but mass literacy campaigns to bring literacy to everybody, right? Educate whatever age you are, we're going to try and bring literacy to you. And the barefoot doctors, you know, they didn't have the infrastructure to immediately give people access to great hospitals and clinics and GP studios. But all the same, they said, we must bring basic medical care to everybody. And they had a kind of speeded up campaign of, or, or process of training it, people in basic medical care so they could be sent out, the barefoot doctors they were called, into all the most remote parts of China and bring basic medical care that was totally lacking totally lacking. It's like when you read that on Tibet, they didn't have a single hospital before the revolution. You know, this wonderfully uh, liberated, peaceful place, not one hospital. So, you know, th these campaigns to, to change conditions for the ordinary people were so important. Uh, I think, uh, Hopal, maybe you could tell us a bit more about some of the drives that they had. How did they change the conditions for women, for example? You know, they were just moving from feudalism. Obviously, the, the war had helped to speed up the process of liberating women from feudal conditions, but they must have still been prevailing quite strongly. Well, yes, I mean, the, the ideology of the Communist Party was that women are half the population. Or in the, in the words of Mao Zedong, they hold up half the skies. Half, half the sky. Unless you have women on your side, you cannot make a revolution. You know, they're a very important part. They raise children. They're in the family, they have a lot of influence, and you can't keep them backward and then still hope to make gigant gigantic progress. For the first time, education was brought to women, especially women of working class and, 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 and peasant background. Health care was brought, you know, from sanitary health to elimination of other diseases to reducing to the maximum infant mortality and 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 the deaths of mothers during 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 pregnancy very base, basic things the chinese thought very creatively about these things and their their attitude towards medicine always reminds me of a character in turgenev's uh, uh, one of turgenev's no novels where two doctors are posted in a backward rural place in Tsarist Russia. And one says to the other, you know, we learned medicine in St. Petersburg and we were trained for years and years. All that is useless because there are two diseases that the peasantry suffered from. One is common cold and the other one is constipation. And we got no cure, cure for it. 
So the Chinese went for the simple method. They couldn't wait to have properly trained doctors going through education for five, six years before they came to help China. So the barefoot doctors were given basic training to go into the villages, to go into the countryside and treat people of the diseases that were very common and that could be dealt with either by basically applying ordinary sanitary health, health rules or by giving some sort of medicine. Most Chinese people were not dying of heart attacks, so you didn't really need cardiac surgeons at that time. I mean, there are more of them dying of heart attack now. You know, it, it's a disease that comes with, um, if you like, the advance, advance of civilization. You have more material wealth. You don't do the exercise and all the rest, rest, rest of it. So then they really had very, very revolutionary methods of dealing with, with the situation in the shortest period of time. The same, as, the same in education, you know. Those who knew something taught other people. You didn't always have proper teachers. Some who had learned to read and write taught other people to read and write. And in this way, the whole campaign had a multiplier effect or a short period of time, illiteracy and innumeracy were, if not eliminated, drastically reduced. So you only have to compare China and India. China hardly has any illiterate people or innumerate people in it. Even after 75 years of independence of the British, there are still vast swathes of the Indian population who are illiterate and innumerate. And that's bound to happen when you have four or five year old kids working as domestic servants. And it's a disgusting sight to see that there are nine, 10 year old poor children looking after one, two year old rich, rich kids when they should be in school, they should be learning something. They're actually doing the chores that they should not at their age, age be doing. So the Chinese have tremendous campaigns of education and, and health. These are remarkable achievements. And people who will tell you everything went down the pipe during Mao's time, they cannot explain to you how during those 30 years, the longevity of life increased by 30 years, one year for one, one year of extra life for every year of the Communist Party's rule during Mao's time. That's from liberation to 1978. Yes, it was indeed absolutely phenomenal. And that ties connects very nicely actually to something else which is often hurled at Mao, which is uh, the famine of 1960 to 61. Now, we hear a lot about how it was socialism was to blame for this famine, but what nobody ever seems to notice is there's been no famine since. <laughs> so something must have happened, right? So do either of you, Caleb or Paul, want to talk a little bit about the, the roots of that famine and why there hasn't been one since then? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's worth noting um, that, uh, and I, I've demonstrated this, I, I've, I've talked about this on my YouTube channel quite a bit, is that, you know, that famine, the, the Great Leap Forward famine that, that happened, um, the Wikipedia page for it is miles long. Uh, it's huge because they try to blame it on the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but there were famines in China before the revolution, routinely. People died of malnutrition all the time. And there is another famine that happened in 1928 uh, in which millions of Chinese people died. And it has like three sentences on its Wikipedia page. Why? Because there's no political value to it. So who cares if people died, you know, before China had socialism? It doesn't matter. There were famines created by the Opium Wars. There were famines created by the Century of Humiliation. Um, and, you know, Edgar Snow, the great American journalist, described in the 1920s in China, there were mass famines that took place because they didn't have a strong central government and they couldn't bring food to areas that had food shortages. Also, because areas that should have been growing food were growing opium poppies and, you know, for, for, the, for the British Empire and for the, the drug trade. So, so there, were, there were hundreds of millions of people who died in famines before the communists took power. And the Chinese communists are the ones who ended the famines. Um, so this notion 
that somehow the communists killed millions of people with famines. It's just, it's such a ridiculous claim. It's the communists who ended the famines and saved China from these frequent crises of malnutrition that were a plague of not having development, being kept in chronic poverty by the imperialists. So it's ridiculous. Also, it's worth noting that there's a quote from Mao Zedong that is used. It's not just, it's used in every anti-communist book that you can find in the United States. There's a quote from China where he's quoted as saying, quote, half of China may have to die. And they say, oh, that shows that Mao was so committed to his communism, he was willing to starve half of China in order to fulfill his policies. Well, if you look at the context of the quote, he's actually saying the exact opposite. He's saying that if we don't change our policies dramatically to resolve the problems of, of this famine that we're having, half of China is gonna die. So the fact that they would lie so blatantly taking a quote out of context where he's clearly saying the opposite of what they're saying that he's saying, uh, just to play up this idea that Mao intentionally starved all these people with this famine when it's Mao who cured the famines shows how completely dishonest they are. Uh, there's a book that was published in the United States called Mao's Great Famine, and it has a starving child on the cover. The photograph is of this starving child. It's supposed to be of a child who starved as a result of this great famine created by the Great Leap Forward. That photograph was taken in 1947. It's a Time Life magazine photograph from 1947 before the Chinese Communist Party even took power. So they're not even being honest with the photograph they put on the cover of the book. That the level of blatant deception when it comes to this issue, that yes, the Great Leap Forward happened and it was awful, right? It was, it was you know, something that they had tried to cure one of these mass episodes of malnutrition, you know, that happened all the time under the old system that unfortunately again happened in the early 1960s because of problems in the socialist system. But I mean, they cured the famines and the amount of utter deception and propaganda we see around this issue is just utterly shocking, right? I mean, do you think that China would, you know, a country as big as China would solve all of its problems uh, of malnutrition, all of its problems of underdevelopment overnight? Uh, and and uh, the fact they didn't immediately, the day Mao came to power, there was never any malnutrition ever again. Well, that proves communism doesn't work. It's such a ridiculous standard by which to judge what they did. Um, as Harpel talked about, uh, if it weren't for the Chinese Communist Party, many millions of Chinese people would have never seen a doctor in their lives, would have never had access to literacy. It was the Chinese Communist Party that mechanized agriculture and created the modern farm system, for goodness sakes. I mean, it's, 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 it's so ridiculous the narrative that we get in the United States. So that's what I wanted to say about that. And I wanted to say we should probably finish on this point um, and then do the cultural revolution in our, in our next podcast. That's my suggestion regarding uh, time. Definitely. Um, before we close off, Paul, did you have anything more you wanted to say on that? Well, it's not really the imperialist propaganda is an insult, not to the intelligence of communists, but to of the ordinary people who are asked to believe that as soon as the communists come to power, their main program is to kill people. You know, their main program is to starve people. Their program is to bring fam famine, fam famine, famine conditions. The, 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 the difficulties in food sector in 1962, 1961-62, arose basically from the fact that there was severe drought in some areas and there was severe flooding in other areas. It's also the time when at similar conditions prevailed in India and there was a famine of the same magnitude. Do you hear of that? No, because India is a darling of imperialist countries. They don't... Democratic famine, Dad. It's a democratic country. But it, it happened in man, ma, ma, many countries like during the period of Mugabe. There was famine in one year, but there was a famine all across Africa because of crop, crop, crop failures. So you, governments cannot be blamed for the weather condition, no matter how powerful those governments are. They cannot control, control, control the weather. These things happen. But what can be said with certainty is that even when there's a shortage of food, these countries do not let the rich to go good and the poor, poor to starve. Whatever is there is distributed. So people may for a short period of time be malnutritioned, suffering from malnutrition, but they don't go completely without food. And the word famine really should only be used where actually there is proof that millions of people starved to death. And they, 
nobody has ever produced that apart from producing fake pictures of 1947 of a child starving on the cover of some U U US ma 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 magazine. And I don't really buy this, uh, not because I'm oblivious of the fact that conditions sometimes have been bad under socialism because of all kind, kind of, kind of reasons. For example, you have D DPRK. It's not allowed to have normal trade relations with foreign countries. So whenever there is shortage of something, they blame the Korean leadership. They never say what is their, their, their part in it. If the Koreans build missiles, they're told they're building missiles while starving their people. It's not a trade-off between the two. If they didn't build missiles, their people would be starved to a far greater degree by the control of imperialism over this tiny country called the D D D DPRK. So I think we have to guard against imperialist propaganda and constantly be on the alert and fight against it. Absolutely. Well, we're going to leave our discussion there for this time, but there's definitely more to come. There's so much to say about China and so much to learn from its experience and its examples uh, in all kinds of ways. So thank you very much for listening to us today and we'll see you back here in two weeks time. Yep.